Right, let's get straight into it. If anyone saw my last talk, then you've probably seen who I am, etc. But if you didn't, here's some things. I work for Server Density, we do monitoring. I have Twitter and GitHub, you can go and look at my code, and I also curate PHP Weekly for my sins. Right, so what is release engineering? I'll read it out in case anyone happens to be blind. A sub-discipline in software engineering concerned with the compilation, assembly, and delivery of source code into finished products or other software components. There are various formal definitions uh, regards to that. You can go and look up the Wikipedia entry where I got this from, but I'm not going to cover the formal definitions because they're boring, quite frankly. And to be honest, you don't really come across a lot of the cultural or formal definitions for these sort of things. You're, you want to know about building and shipping code. <coughs> so, the first thing that usually comes up is, build, I don't build code. I, I work in a dynamic language. My code isn't compiled and shipped. I work in a dynamic language. I commit to GitHub. I push it somewhere and it's deployed in, on Heroku or something like that. So, builds are just for people who make games and ship CDs out, surely. Or um, Linus Torvalds building the Linux kernel. No. We all are concerned with building code because we ship a product. You ship a product to someone. Even if, like Server Density, it's a website somewhere that someone logs into, we have to ship that code to a server so someone can actually use it in the first place. We have releases, we have new versions of the product. You probably do too. Even if you're working in an agency, you're still going to release that code somewhere at the end of the day, whether it's for testing the initial version of it or it's for full sign-off and release or for QA. Pretty much every language now has a way of tracking dependencies and building your project and then sending that build somewhere. I mean, as quick examples, Ruby has... Bundle and the other gems, Python has eggs and PHP has Composer and Node has NPM, etc., etc., etc. Everything has some way of building things and keeping track of version dependencies. The other thing I often hear is because you've started using continuous integration, like all of us do, and you should, you don't need to care about the release of your build because the continuous integration, make sure your builds are always perfect. Well, no, continuous integration is concerned with one tiny part of the whole release cycle. And that is making sure before you commit into master or into trunk that, think that tests have been run and that you have test coverage, that your tests are all green down the page. You have a bunch of ticks that says, this code works before I commit it and merge it back in. And make sure that it doesn't break everything. And same again with actual deployed systems. Where we, it's a wonderful time to live in that we have things like Puppet and Chef and Salt and various other configuration management systems which allow us to deploy whole servers with the same, pretty much the same way we build an application. We write a set of code with a specification and we run that code and it deploys a server for us somewhere, whether that's an instance in the cloud or it's an actual box on a network somewhere. But that's just the box. That's just your system. Your system shouldn't be concerned with your version dependencies for your application or whether you've um, run all your tests for your application or whether your application can be run from the right system binaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing configuration management should care about is making sure Linux is deployed with the right version of something out of apt, and you can log into it, and the right security patches have been applied. And then maybe it can then run your build, uh, build steps. Uh, men, plenty of people use their configuration management system to actually run their build, so you can deploy to a server on AWS or Rackspace or somewhere else, and Chef will say, build my application after it's deployed the rest of the system, and you'll have a fresh build on the system deployed somewhere. That's one way of doing it, and that's fine. It's also a slightly fragile way of doing it. 
so because you deploy continuously, versions are irrelevant because every time I deploy continuously, every time I push out to my server, I'm just going to run the latest gems for my Ruby application or get the latest eggs for Python. It's all, you know, it's the dependency is star or there is no dependency or I'm just getting the latest master branch or something like that. So, but then what happens when it breaks? What happens if it breaks in ways that your tests can't tell? And the only time you actually find out about it is when you've deployed a thousand servers with the latest dependencies of everything. And the very latest dependency of something broke. Or even worse, you're halfway through deploying everything. And you suddenly get a new version. Because you're not pinning your versions to something. Or you're not testing your versions properly in your testing cycle. So obviously, um, all of our devs know about our release cycle. Yeah, I, I know all about the release cycle. Well, actually, yeah, I do, but I make sure that I know all about the release cycle. But I also make sure everyone else knows about the release cycle. That's part of what release engineering is about. It's not saying developer A knows how to build the product and ship it, because Many people are involved in building the product, whether it's more than one developer, whether it's the ops team, whether it's Q and A, etc. Even if it's the even if it's the customer working in agencies before, I've had customers who were entirely responsible for deploying onto their own systems. We just had to make sure the asset which we built and bundled up and gave to them was something that they could then deploy in the way they knew how to and how their servers worked. So yeah, devs should know how it's built, but then ops should know how it's built as well. And so should QA. Everyone should be re uh, involved right down the process. Because if they're not, well, as a developer, I can add a new dependency to something, but maybe it needs C libraries. Maybe it needs to be compiled when it's installed with pip install dot. And then that means that's now a system dependency that needs to go along with my application dependency. And uh, that means ops need to know about it as well because they, they define what goes on the servers, what goes on those builds, on, on the box builds as opposed to the application build. So those C libraries need to be available so that the application will build. That's now two people who need to know how the entire deployment works because if only one person knows about each point, then if the other changes, how does the other one know? Going back to that point, do th does anyone from dev, ops, QA actually know why it's built this way? Um, why do we need the XML passing libraries from apt-get? Well, actually, we're using the lib, you know, we, we need libxml available because we're using a special XML pass right now Python li library because we need to pass some XML coming in and doing it any other way would be horrible. So yeah, that's why. But if you don't know the why, then when things start to break or things aren't shipped, someone's likely to just go, eh, I don't know why we needed this in the first place. I'll just take it out of the deployment cycle. Uh, but what if it broke something else? What if something else is depending on it? Everyone needs to know how your product is shipped and why it might have broken. If you don't know why something is broken, then you'll prob then anyone could come up with an unworkable fix. It might work for that one situation, but it might break something else, or it might break in the future. This is why it's best to pin dependencies to an actual version that you know you're building against, because if you suddenly switch and change things, at least you can test them. And at least you know why you were using those versions in the first place, because they'll be alongside another dep uh, dependency. So for a nice tenant to, to, to use, document. Document everything. Document the crap out of everything. Because without documentation, you can't explain to other people. You can have quick conversations on HipChat or IRC or IM or, or through email or even on your ticket system, but those will get lost. If you have one place where you know why you're building something, even if it's a bullet point list that says, we go in, we run make, then we tar and gzip up the binaries and we copy them over to another server 
or we commit that into another form of source control and we push those somewhere or even if it's just those manual steps are written down and then document your automated processes because the document uh, the automated processes will break at some point as well and they should be tied into the documentation of how something was built automate automate ev automate everything until you find that you can't automate it and try and ask yourself why not to automate it <laughs> because if you automate then you can run ci you can run continuous deployment and you can make that your build steps it's fine having your build steps automated having a build system we have a build system that handles both our continuous integration and our part of our deployment system but there's a manual step at some point where someone steps in and goes yeah, let's, let's deploy that. We'll push a button and it'll get deployed. But the manual step is nice to have because you know someone's understanding the process. You know someone has to go in and say, yeah, I understand how this has worked. I understand that green means all the tests passed and actually maybe there's a red somewhere. If there's a red at any point but it's not blocking the deploy, maybe it's still something you should question. So automate everything within reason. Automate everything that makes sense to you and going back to an earlier talk if you have trouble getting management to let you automate things if you can build something quick build a quick automation and then show them how much better it is and show them how much money can be saved just for running things automatically and and then show other examples like github and places like that that have made this work and make more money by having their processes automated. So security is actually one of the biggest reasons to have a release, a release management process, a really part of release engineering, because you're, if you're running a continuous integration and you're, and you're bumping your version dependencies, etc., etc., then you'll keep up to date with the latest versions of all your dependencies and that's great but as we said earlier it breaks so you need to pin but when you pin your dependency you lose the latest security updates or stability updates or anything like that and does that mean someone has to go through everything every week and push a button and use the latest version well you don't you can still you can still automate that you can automate changing your dependencies quite easily. It's just, a, it's just a, a matter of running a separate command with most of these systems, which says run without versions and see how it all breaks. And when it breaks, you can send that, that report to someone else or send it to yourself and look at how it broke. And if it's just a case of you need to change one line, you create a new branch in your source control, you change that one line, you commit it, you get someone else to look at it and you sign off on it and now you've got the latest security deployed. So that's a good reason. And also knowing how your application is built means you know where, um, where security problems can arise from attackers, where there are injection points. For example, we use GitHub for all our Git source control. And we also continuously um, build from GitHub and have a push button to deploy from the last build. So if someone does another Ruby on Rails hack to get access to, a GitHub, uh, to our GitHub repos, then they can change code on master without even doing a pull request or anything like that. And the next build will suddenly have their change code, will have their injection in it. And you don't want that. And that's the entire reason for the having that one button. It's just a button, you log in, we have two-factor authentication. Use Google Authenticator to just log in, push a button that says "build this," and it has the it has the um, the commit hash next to it. And I can just quickly look on um, the Git repo and say, "Yep, there's nothing dodgy in here, or there hasn't been since the last build that's been deployed." I can push it now. But by understanding those build steps, I can also understand injections along the way like injections into Chef or into, the require, into our dependencies. You, an attacker could literally just go in and change the version back down. 
to an older, less secure dependency, which suddenly gives us the same injection vector into our application. So um, I did plan to have some actual examples on the screen here for, um, for deploy uh, deploying, but I've probably covered most of those while talking about them. Um, I'll quickly describe how, um, yet again, how our, uh, our system works. So you create a branch. All of our branches on GitHub are just continuously built. So that runs tests. It has to build the system in order to be able to run those tests, because otherwise, if you were running against a different system, then you could have problems with the version of Linux or any other dependencies that are installed. So it does all those, does all those steps. Fresh new system, builds the application, runs all the tests, tells, it, tells us whether it passed or failed. And um, obviously, someone goes on to a pull request for the um, branch and signs off on it, saying, yeah, this is all fine, or maybe they don't. Maybe they say, this bit's crap, change it. But eventually, it'll get merged back into master. And as well as getting built upon the merge into master, we also have a nightly build. So we can just check for any. Sometimes you can't always pin all dependencies. Sometimes you have dependencies of dependencies that get unpinned and things like that. So we have this nightly build just to make sure there's nothing transcendental, nothing that just creeps in and makes the system suddenly stop, bu stop building and stop working. So you have a built master. You, the, at the very end of the build for a master run, you ha we have just a system that tars everything up, removes other artifacts like the Git repo itself. The, um, the Git artifacts just get removed because we don't necessarily want to deploy that. Because if you deploy your .git directory, then someone on live might just be able to go git pull and get the version, latest version of master completely getting around the fact that there's a whole deployment system with checks and balances in there. So remove all those, tar, tar it up, copy it up to an S3 bucket because it's a cheap place to store large binaries and have them synced somewhere else. And then we just have a process which runs continuously on our deployed systems, which syncs with S3 and looks for a new build that's been marked as deployed. The, to mark a build as deployed, you have to go in and click that button. Literally, all that does is change the file name on the S3 bucket. It's, it's, just, it's just a simple step which stops every build from getting automatically deployed without that simple... Um, manual step of pressing the button. So now you have a, a, a big ball. It could be a binary ball. It could still be just PHP scripts or you know, just dynamic scripts that have been pulled together and built and run. So you have this binary to push up and gets unzipped or untarred, etc. And one of, the one of the main things is that it's been built against the exact same system that is deployed. So you don't have to care about different locations for, for dependencies or anything like that. Or another problem is, is it, f is it a 32-bit system? 64-bit system. On some builds like with Python, that can make a difference. There are lots of other examples of doing these things, and you can do them pretty much with any CI system. Um, my preferred way, which we currently aren't doing but may move to in the future, is to have two separate systems, one for doing CI. So there's lots of nice services like Travis CI that do continuous deployment and you can install your own Jenkins. We use one by Atlassian called Bamboo, just because we were using it before. Um, but you don't have to have CI do your entire build system. You obviously have to have some build steps in your CI because you need a build in order to test it. But you don't necessarily have to do all of the build steps. So a lot of build steps could give you uh, integration tests. An integration test is a full live deployment test. So if you have multiple services, you need all of them deployed on the same machine, or at least reachable by the same machine. And you actually run tests as if the user was doing it which is different to unit tests, as we all know, because unit tests are just testing that one unit of code and checking the outcome. So you don't have to have your CI do deployment. There are really good systems for doing CI. 
I, if anyone's not doing CI, I urge you to go and check them out. But you can also, there are also very good systems for doing builds and deployment and orchestration. Uh, for example, there is BuildBot, which is a Python build system which can uh, build things together and can also be made to run exactly in the same way that Travis CI runs using a .travis.yml file. So your CI and build steps are still the same. So they're still built exactly the same. But you also get to then cluster your builds. You can maybe give them more higher priority. You can deploy them in different ways. Because one of the disadvantages to running your um, building during CI is the fact that you have to have this asset gathering at the end of your build step against master every time and copying it to somewhere that can be deployed, like the S3 bucket, which takes a hell of a long time. It can often add, you know, it may not sound long, but adding five, six minutes onto the end of the build, when, say, you're in the middle of, a, um, of an oh crap moment on live, things just aren't working properly, and you need to get this fix out right away, all the checks have been done, all your tests have been done, per, people have done pull requests in order to do it, but, but you just can't get it out fast enough because you're waiting five to six minutes for an asset to be deployed to an S3 bucket. So having a separate build system can come in very handy for situations like that because you can prioritize things. Anyway, that was that. Um, there's various code on the um, server density GitHub repo. My own GitHub profile has various code for various things. Uh, there's a nice chef recipe on there, actually. Uh, my Both of my talks are on that GitHub repo as well. And as I said earlier, my um, talk slides were illustrated, well, apart from on this one, most of these were photos off the internet. But my other talk slides were illustrated by um, Jonathan Oliver, who's a good friend of mine. And if you have any questions, either ask them now or grab me. Thank you.